sentence and then whatever you're thinking. <coughs> oh yeah, view. So under the particular assignment, um, you can view whatever you So go view the, uh, I can't show you. <laughs> Next to this thing, you should see view and then like zero or something, or zero or one or two, depending on if you turn it in. And if you click that, then it will show you your grade. And on the on your profile page, you should be able to see what grade you currently have in the class. And don't worry about that too much because for um, the things that we haven't graded yet are currently all zero in the system, so your grade will look like it's a lot worse than it actually is. But I think right now the, le the quizzes are out of like the, the, the maximum score is like 0.33 or something. Six six. Six six, something like that. Yeah. But yeah. If you're just wondering, we can look at your grade too. So. Does anyone have any questions? Your lab fours and fives are all at the right location, right? Because we will dock you, and you don't know when we're going to start grading it. So do it now if you haven't done it. Did you say it was forbidden? Uh, oh yeah, forbidden is not okay. You have, we have to be able to access it, and that's uh, you have to change the permissions on the board. And there are instructions in the STP, STP um, instructions on how to change permissions on the board. Yeah. So it has to actually show us your files. Like forbidden is not okay. Like. This, doesn't, this page doesn't exist, it's not okay, because then we have nothing to grade. So. Okay. Um, oh yeah, we moved the deadline for Mindy Project 1 to next Friday, because it just came out last Friday. Um, and today we're going to cover uh, advanced CSS techniques. So things like floating, which some of you may know already, or some of you, like floating in the index, which some of you may know already, because you did it on your Extra for Experts on the lab. Um, and we're going to go over centering. A lot of people have asked questions about how you center things. And we're going to go over CSS3, which is really exciting. So, oh yeah, and you also have an advanced CSS lab, but because it's like midterm season for a lot of you guys, and you guys have a project you next week, it's going to be super short. Like, it's like really easy. And, oh, and it's actually, it's actually the extras for experts from previous labs. So if you did those, you have no lab to do today. Unless you want to do the extra for experts today, which is really fun. So I recommend you do, but... Oh, my bad. The attendance code for today is this number that I will paste over here. Well, who else remembers one? 
Oh, you don't want to Oh, okay. Applying yes. Absolute. absolute, exactly. So absolute is fixed positioning. Um, both take an element out of flow of the document. So floating does this, floating does this, uh, does this as well, except it also pushes it left or right. And what I mean by pushing it left or right, I'll show you the previous in the um, next slide. But well, there's one really weird thing. Um, it takes Floating an element takes it out of the flow of the document, but for some reason, text can still see it. So as you see here, um, we have these, this, these orange boxes that are floated, and text can still see it. And I don't really know why, that's just the way it is. So I'm sure about that. Um, and it's, so you just uh, invoke it by giving the CSS property float, and you can say its values are right or left or none. So it's just like how you would usually do your CSS properties. Like if you were to set a color on something, this is just setting float. OK, so if you flow three elements in the same direction, they will stack. Um, so here is a um, three divs originally. And if you, have, if you apply float left to all of them, they'll actually stack vertically, which is exactly what you want. And this is an advantage over um, absolute positioning, obviously, because they'll like stack on top of each other. So it doesn't matter how wide this is, you don't have to know that for positioning needs. So just like, stack on top of each other like boxes that are like anti-gravity or something. Um, yeah, these are all floating. Um, yeah, this is floating. Yes, this is floating, this is floating, this is floating. So why do these two have to be floated? Like, this is here originally, right? Like, why do we have to float these two? Do we know? Like, can't we just float, just float these two, and then it will be the same thing? Because you're not changing the position. This is right in the corner anyways. Anyone guess? It's related to the last question that I asked. <laughs> Close the left one. Uh -huh. Would be in the flow of the document. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So remember what I said about oh, here's your candy. Remember what I said just like five seconds ago about floating an element takes it out of the flow of the document. So if you didn't float this one, these ones, this one will be in the flow of the document, and these ones will be out of it. So they'll be like, okay, the next thing on my left is just the wall. So they'll they'll cover this up. <coughs> so the weird thing is that it takes it out of the flow, but everything that's floated is out of the flow too, so they can see each other. So just remember that. And um, some of you may have seen this on the Facebook feed, uh, Extra for Experts, but if there isn't enough room, they'll just, like, there's, like, physically is not enough room for this floated uh, element, so they'll just stack, just like regular things. So if you see this problem, like you're working on something, you're like, I don't know what's going on, I floated these, but it's still stacking vertically, and maybe because this one's too long, so it is just forced under it anyways. Okay, so a couple of important properties. Um, floated elements should have a specified width, um, just so they can stack onto, just so the, like, the browser knows how to render it when it's stacking them um, horizontally. And also, just reiterating so you guys don't forget, floating removes the element from the flow of the layout. Um, that means um, other elements have no ideas there, except for text, weirdly. So if I have an example where um, I have these two blue divs stacked on, just like regularly positioned, right, because divs stack vertically, and I have this orange box inside the top, um, this top div, and I suddenly want, feel like I want to float the, um, I want to float the orange box. What will happen? This is perfect. This is why I do these animations. So I can ask questions like these. <coughs> yeah. Where is the orange box? It's within. It's within this blue box. So these blue boxes are stacked. So they're like the first level, and this orange box is the child of this blue box. So it's actually inside, nested inside. So what will happen if I try to say float left on this orange box? Nothing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it actually take it out of that blue box and then it's, it would work around the same, but it's just funny. It looks so, like the same, but it wouldn't be a child of that blue box anymore. Uh, close. It actually does this. Bam. And you weren't expecting that. Was that, oh, was that what you were saying? No. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry, I just pointed that out. <laughs> but, okay, so what is happening here? So you're actually floating this left thing, so it's like, okay, I'm out of the flow now, so I'm gonna go walk over to the left, and then, like, until I hit a wall, which is basically the edge of the browser, right? Um, but it actually takes it out of the flow of the document, so these don't even know it's here anymore, so not even the, the container that it was in before. So it's like, oh, there's nothing in me, so I'm actually empty. So I'll just, so this is, this is actually not technically correct. Um, this box would be nothing, because remember, if you have a div, with nothing in it, it just doesn't show at all. So this is actually like, this is it only look like, if you had these colored, um, if these divs were both colored blue ones, it would just show 
like two empty, which show nothing basically. Like these blue ones uh, completely disappear because they have nothing in them, right? Um, so the interesting thing about this is this blue box, if you look at the HTML, it's not like it takes it out of the, if it takes it out of its parent, right? So if you look at the HTML, it's still <coughs> inside of it, but um, looking at it like on your screen, it looks like it's out of its parent now, just because uh, this parent doesn't even know it's there because it's floating. Does anyone have any questions? Floating is pretty tricky, but it's very crucial to many layouts. So, so just to clarify, the parent doesn't know it's there? Yeah, because you took it out of the flow of the document. So now if this parent has nothing else in it, it's like, okay, I'm empty. So it just. Like, so in so, so an example, like in the Facebook example, like you want, obviously you want to flow to the right so the text stays there, but you still want to keep it inside its own border. So mm -hmm. how would you do that? I'll show you after. But yeah, so for example, if these had borders, um, and so this would show a border on this thing, and this this child is obviously in here, so the div kind of expands to fit his child, and you float, you suddenly float the child, then the parent will become really small because there's nothing in it anymore. And how do we fix this? Um, there's a technique, or actually not technique, because it's crucial, um, a thing called clearing floats, which is what you do to prevent the um, to prevent these things from kind of like shriveling up, right? So um, there's a CSS property called clear, and you set it on the property below the element that you're trying to <laughs> push up. Oh, can you close the Thanks. So there are a couple of values that this can take on. Um, left, right, um, which push the element down below any left or right floating elements, or both, which push it down, push it down below any like floating elements, period. So I'll show you what you mean. So um, if you had this example again, oh, did you have a question? Did you also Yes. I think so, yeah. If you float the parent, the inside will still show, it'll show, I guess. But then this one will scoot up too. So they'll be overlapping. It's because, or like, you could float everything, but that's really bad practice. Because then you have like really weird behaviors when you're afraid to float something, or just, it's undefined. So don't float everything as a solution to getting things to show up. You actually just want to clear the floats. <coughs> so um, for example, if I have these two divs here, same example, I'm floating this element, this orange element to the left, and I add a clear left to this bottom div, then it'll show up exactly as you expected, right? So, or what you hope would happen. This big div will know, actually the big div won't know it's here, but this one will know it's there. Well, this one will know it's there, so this one will expand to 50 div inside. Wait, which one will expand? This one will expand, because now it's there now. It's kind of confusing, it's not like, it's still out of, it's still out of the flow, but this bottom div now knows that um, it's supposed to clear this one, so it, it goes down, um, it pushes itself under, and then this one expands to the space. Pushes itself under the, the floating thing? Yeah, under the floating thing. So instead of being here, it knows, oh, I'm supposed to clear anything on the left, so it goes down here. Yeah. Did you have a question? <laughs> so when you give a div a clear, then it can see the float, as if it like, just yeah. like how it can't mm -hmm. them. So then, then what's its position within the float down? Uh, what? So like, when you can see the flow, it's still in the flow of the document though, right? Yes. It pushes itself under. So when you say clear left, it means push me under anything that has a flow of left. And you can say clear both to push it down any, uh, um, to push it down under any flow of elements. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Wait, so why is the top blue box, why was that one um, expanded? Oh, it just, I don't, I think it's just like, Everything magically fixes itself, so it's still this one is still out of the flow of the document. But since this one pushes it down, this one expands the whole space. But we only. Um... But you only apply a clear to the bottom one. Yeah. So it wouldn't work if you tried to apply a clear to this one because it's not under any. It's not under any floated element. Does that make sense? So you have to apply. Um, yeah. So let's set this property on the element below. So if you want to clear something, you need to create an element, usually like a div or something, and. Um, Put it under the element and then set its property to clear, or set its property clear to like left, right, or both. Does that make sense? Anyone confused? Who completely understands this? Okay, ask more questions. <laughs> no questions. Okay, you're gonna get a quiz next week about floats. Some people like that. Okay, so. Just, Anyone not understand the behavior of floats? So if you float something, you take it out of the flow of the, el the document, so nothing else knows it's there. But you can also set elements to have a clear property, 
which tell it to push itself down under any left, right, or both cleared, uh, floated elements. No, everything floats. When you have a, when you float a, um, good question. When you float a parent, it floats its children too. So if you had stuff inside here, it's not like these would all like scatter around. They would float with the parent. Yeah. So yes. Can you float spans as well as this? I believe so. John, do you know? I'm pretty sure you can float anything because you can float images too. So it's not just block elements that you float. So. Huh? Okay. Cool. Well, if you're shy, you can just ask me questions later. Or John and Alan. The next thing we're going to talk about is the index and. This is kind of just reiterating things that you may or may not have done in the extra for experts already. So do you guys remember that um, layout lab that you had that was really tedious and like putting things into different, um, or obsolete positioning different things? And you had a layout that was overly simplified to look like this. And you had a little coffee cup, right? And what happened when you tried to move the coffee cup up? Coffee cup, right? Innovation. So when you try to move the coffee cup, cup up, you, it got covered up by like, one of these elements. Um, and there's a way called Z index. It's actually another property that you can use to specify what Z like index you want it to be. So imagine, you guys are all sort of like math, right? So this is the X axis, Y axis, and the Z axis is like coming out of the page. So Z index uh, specifies what thing it should be. So if you set this to 15, I think the default for everything is zero, but it um, the order is kind of under, or the, the, stack, the layering of it is undefined if everything is zero. Like, you don't know what it will be. It might render differently in different browsers. But if you put like Xenus is, for example, 15, it'll show up in front of everything else. And this is super useful, especially if you're doing like image-based layouts. Like, you want to be able to place things in front of other elements. So, just the index and some integer value. And I believe you can also do uh, negative too. So, if you use a negative like five, it'll just put it behind everything. Make sense? Yes. Is there a bound to how large this is? I think it's just um, the bound to like how big an integer can be. Oh, okay. So like <laughs> four million, two to the thirty-two. Two to the <laughs> huh? Thirty-one. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like four million or something. So I guess you can keep like if you had a program that was like incrementally adding it, right, without resetting them, you go to four million. So should be okay for most cases. <laughs> I don't know why you would have more than four million elements on page. Some people like just like incre increment them like wildly, like one like a thousand or something, but that's the exact same thing as one and two. So it's just relative. Okay, center. So there are several useful things that you may want to do in the course of your career as a web designer. Um, so the first thing is centering text in a div. And this is pretty easy. There's a, um, a property that's called text align and you can set it to center and you put that on the div. So anything inside of it will be, or anything that is like a, like content-based will be centered. So for example, text and images will be centered, but not like divs. Because those are those count as sectional content, not um, not content content. Um, but if you do want to horizontally center a div, we have this very nice um, property called margin auto, which kind of resets um, both the left and right and automatically calculates it so it looks like it's um, centered. And the important thing to know about this is you have to have a width set on this. So the browser can do, can do its calculations. If you don't have a width set on this, for example, you just said like div width equals auto, it'll just stay, it'll hang out like over here. And you'll be like, why isn't it working? I said margin, margin auto, but it has to have a set size width. So for example, um, like 10% or 10 pixels or whatever. Um, the third thing is vertically centering a text in a div. Um, and there's a trick to do this. You can just set the line height of the div to be the same height as the div itself. So for example, if you have a div, like, this is like making buttons, right? This is a really like, um, common use case. So if you're making buttons and you have the text in the button image to be like centered vertically, um, and you have a, the button height of like 10, um, you can just make the line height equal to 10 as well, and then it'll be centered. It's kind of a trick that people use. I don't know if it's like, it was meant for that purpose. Okay, cool. So now we come to the third part of the lecture, the really cool part. Um, this lecture's kind of short. What time is it? You guys will get a lot of time to work on your labs and projects and midterms. Uh, no, we won't have a midterm in this class. I meant your other <laughs> midterms. Sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. We should have a midterm this time. <laughs> um, okay, so with CSS3, 
3. Um, we talked briefly about CSS3 in the beginning of lecture, or beginning of the, all of the lecture, so beginning of class. Um, and you can do a lot of cool effects um, with CSS3. So before, remember when you guys did last, um, last class, you guys did those dynamically scaling buttons because you wanted to have those rounded corners, right? Sometimes it's really tedious to do those. If you want like a variable width and height box, it's like because with rounded corners, it becomes really, really complicated. So same with gradients, people used to do all these tricks to get gradients to work and drop shadows and all that stuff. But now with CSS3, you get a lot of those for free. Um, though, like kind of warning or disclaimer, CSS3 isn't fully compatible with all browsers yet. Um, so use at your discretion. Um, so cool things that you can now do with CSS3 for free, but basically one line of code. Um, gradients, drop shadows, rounded corners, um, multi-column layouts, media queries, and transforms and animations. Um, so I'll go over those. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, I'll go over these ones. So um, CSS3 gradients, this looks, looks like a lot of code, but you don't have to memorize it or anything. Just copy and paste it once. There are even cool tools like um, this thing. There are even cool tools um, that can help you do your gradients already. So this site I found is really nice. You basically can like color, pick the color, and then like do and this and then drag wherever the position position should be, and it will generate the code for you. The same with um, Firefox. So you don't have to memorize these codes at all. Like I know they look really complicated. I don't even know these by heart. Like I have to look it up every time or like do this tool every time. So don't worry about like memorizing these. These are not things that you have to memorize. Um, and the reason, okay, so there's this kind of like funny story behind why there's like Moz linear gradient and WebKit gradient. So before they were like, before the standards were actually established, um, it's the browsers who are implementing all these things themselves without having a standard. So they have all of these browser specific like um, property types that you need to implement in their own, to have it work in your own browsers just because it wasn't a standard yet. So right now, I don't know if they will, they will standardize it later, like make them all gradient or whatever, um, but for now you have to put all of these together to it. So for example, if you put WebKit but not um, Moz, which is uh, short for Mozilla, if people view your um, website in Firefox, they can't view your gradients. So you need to make sure you put all of these, and they won't conflict or anything. Or does it? Yeah, Internet Explorer. I don't, I don't bother putting Internet Explorer stuff. Um, no, but some of the newer stuff um, will work on IE9. I think they just announced that they're compatible with CSS3 and HTML5. So, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. What about after your final What do you mean? Like, is it done? Uh, I have no idea. Maybe. Well, Maybe. then, like, so, like, <laughs> afterwards, when CSS3 is more finalized, these kind of pictures are going to disappear. So like when you try to use CSS3, you want to make sure to have like the major ones, Moz and WebKit, and also have like just gradient. Like that's the same. That's true for a lot of other things too, like drop shadows. There's like here's uh, something else. Oh yeah, it was like border radius. I'll go over this later. Um, it's like border radius where there's three types, like the Moz kind, the WebKit kind, and then the regular kind. And you want to make sure that you have all three. Or like John said, if they decide to standardize it, and the other ones break. Okay, so drop shadows. You can have full drop shadows, and if you don't have a, if you don't know what a drop shadow looks like, here in the picture, um, they're called box shadows, and it's not really anything that I have to explain. I just want to go over it briefly and tell you what's available. So here's the code, the horizontal, vertical, like these are in pixels, by the way, blurry color, and we have all these resources available in the lab. There are links on the bottom if you want to check them out. And text shadows, um, you can actually see here. I don't think you can see this, but I use actually an inverse text shadow, so it's not like most people think like text shadows are really like like tacky, right, or something like. Oh, I don't want to have it on my website, but you can actually have like nice imprint looking. So if you look at my website and you, if your screen is really bright, you can adjust it certainly. And there's actually an inverse shadow. So instead of doing the traditional black shadow on the bottom, I have a white, one pixel white shadow on top. So it looks like it's engraved into the page kind of. So just cool little tricks that you might not have thought. Of. And you can uh, view the HTML on my website if you would like to know how to do. Okay, so rounded corners, again, I don't really know how much to say about this. Um, here's my website, these are rounded corners, and here's the code. Uh, oh yeah, one note, um, so a lot of these CSS3 things degrade gracefully, and what I mean by degrade gracefully is, if you're on a browser, 
um, and your browser doesn't support a certain rule or something, it will not crash and burn. So, for example, um, CSS3 rounded quarters, if you view it on a website, like if you view it on Internet Explorer, sorry, Alan, um, what will happen? Like, it's not going to be like, sorry, this website is not avail available anymore. Like, it'll just be um, like not rounded quarters, which is perfectly fine. Like, usually people can't even tell the difference. Like, they, they wouldn't know that you, um, they wouldn't even know that they were supposed to be rounded in the first place. So, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is when you're trying to do your um, web designs, you want to make sure that everything kind of degrades gracefully. For example, if I had a website that, uh, well, this is not really relevant, but um, if you had a website that had like floating, right? What if someone tried to view it on a browser that does not support floating? By the way, all the browsers support floating, so don't worry about it. But everything would totally be like ugly, right? Like everything would be smushed in one place. Like maybe things would be like your your um, layout would be completely wrong. Um, but when you're trying to do websites, you want to think about what features you're using that are currently not supported on um, certain browsers, and make sure if they if they are supported, then your website is still usable in some way. And this goes a lot for when we do JavaScript. So a lot of people do JavaScript, like they have like JavaScript navigation or something like that. But if I'm trying to view it on my my phone or some browser that doesn't view JavaScript, I can't even navigate the page because there's no JavaScript. So the right thing to do in that case would be to make sure to check if the browser has JavaScript, and if not, to add some kind of non-JavaScript menu so people who don't have JavaScript can actually use your website. So it doesn't all depend on some one feature that some browsers may or may not support. So that's what um, degrades your experience. And all these CSS properties basically do that. Like, if you don't have gradients, it's a big deal. Like, it just won't show a gradient. Hopefully, you can still read whatever you have there. And same for drop shadows. Like, it's not at the end of the world if someone views it on a browser that does not show um, drop shadows. So, yeah. Oh, okay. So media queries. So, does anyone remember what media queries are? I briefly mentioned it a couple of a couple of lectures before, and it was super cool. Maybe this will jog your memory. Who remembers this website? I show this to you. Who remembers it now? <laughs> okay, cool. So that is the product of media queries. Um, and media queries are basically what they sound like. They, or I guess not what they sound like. Um, never mind, I forget I said that. So media queries basically, you can attach certain um, constraints to when you want to include certain style sheets. For example, you can attach it to stuff. There's two ways you can do it. You can add, you can either attach it to a style sheet like here. So remember, you guys, oh, you did this on your last lab. So you're linking the CSS file and the HTML file together, and you can say media equals screen. That means your computer screen, not like being printed or anything. Um, and max device length or max device width equals 480 pixels. So this is saying that um, the max device width. So if the if whatever thing they're viewing it on is over 480 pixels, don't show this. Only when they're only when it's under 480. So you might have one. Um, so for example, in the simple bits case, that website, they might have one style sheet styling everything for when it's really skinny, and they and then another style sheet for when it's like medium length, and another catch-all style sheet with, which has a minimum device width as well. Does that make sense? So as you, as the browser size increases, it's applying different style sheets. So that's how you get that effect where it's like hiding and like rearranging some things. Because remember, um, HTML should only be the structure of things, and CSS is, how you is, CSS is how you style it. So CSS, like there should only be like one HTML view of it, but you can have infinitely, infinitely many um, CSS views of it, which is why you can do this kind of media support thing. If you went ahead and, I, and you put all of your, I don't know why you do this, but you, if you put all your styling, you like tables and stuff in HTML, and HTML was taking care of all the styling, you could not do this, right? That job is good. But this makes it super easy. And also, I don't know if you've seen those websites where it's like, um, they have the same, did I show a CSS Zen Garden in the beginning? So these websites where it's all literally the same, the exact same HTML, and you can choose different themes that make it look entirely different. Oh, wait, that's different. Yeah, these are all the exact same HTML file. And the way you use CSS just makes them look different. Right? So you completely rearrange things. So this is just emphasizing the fact that HTML is pure structure. So how is that done? Just, just with CSS. So like your HTML for these are exactly the same, and you're applying different um, CSS like style sheets. Yeah, but um, so at the at the head of the HTML document, just links to different style sheets. Yeah. So I think they have some kind of like. So they're they're actually different files. But yeah. The content is the same. 
Yeah, the HTML files are exactly the same, just the 